Uh, hi everyone, I'm Jason Breyer. I'm here with my 42 Better Road colleague, Kath Urquhart, Hello. and uh, welcome to uh, this seminar. Um, now what we're going to do in this seminar is we're going to talk to you about the unambiguous and propriety exception to the without prejudice privilege. And we want to start with a competition to get you thinking. Now, unambiguous impropriety is a 10 syllable mouthful. And we'd like you to come up with a more pithy name for this exception. If you can do so, please stick it in the chat box and we'll choose a winner later. Um, I'm afraid there is no prize uh, other than pride and that warm feeling of having the admiration of your fellow employment lawyers um, uh, or the admiration of your fellow employment lawyers, but hopefully that's enough of an incentive for you. Right, um, we were inspired to produce this seminar by the recent judgment of Mr. Justice Bourne in the Swiss Ray and Sommer case. And it's a judgment which we'd urge you to read carefully and to keep in mind when drafting settlement correspondence or when having settlement conversations. If you get it wrong, the consequences for the client and for your firm can, of course, be significant. Um, the way we're going to split this up is this. I'm going to set the scene by talking about the backgrounds to the without prejudice privilege, the policy reasons for it, and the historic case law on the unambiguous and propriety exception. And then Kath is going to turn to the summer case, its facts, the findings, and the practical consequences that fall out from those findings. And then we'll turn to your questions and do our best to answer them. So if a question comes to you during our talk, please place it in the question and answer box and we'll try to deal with it uh, with as many as possible um, at the end. Um, we're going to have the seminar for an hour so we don't keep you from your dinner or drinks. Now let's start with what the privilege is all about. The classic definition is probably that provided by Lord Justice Oliver in the quite painful sounding case of cuts and head. And what he said there was that the rule rests, at least in part, upon public policy is clear from many authorities and the convenient starting point of the inquiry is the nature of the underlying policy. It's that parties should be encouraged so far as possible to settle their disputes without resort to litigation and should not be encouraged, discouraged by the knowledge that anything that is said in the course of such negotiations may be used to their prejudice in the course of the proceedings. They should be encouraged fully and frankly to put their cards on the table. The public policy justification in truth essentially rests on the desirability of preventing statements or offers made in the course of negotiations for settlement being brought before the court of, of trial as admissions on the question of liability. So it's, it's an enabling privilege. It seeks to ensure that parties feel able to make every effort to settle their claims without worrying that what they say in trying to settle might compromise their case on the substance of the claim if the efforts to settle don't succeed. Or as Lord Hope put it in the Ophelou and Bossert case, it recognises that unseen dangers may lurk behind things said or written during this period, and it removes the inhibiting effect that this may have in the interests of promoting attempts to achieve a settlement. Now, the first mention of the without prejudice privilege in the EAT was in the case of BNP Paribas and Mezzotero, a 2004 case that I'll turn to in due course. But I want to jump five or so years ahead to Woodward and Santander Bank, which was a case in which the claimants sought to bring victimization claims, resulting from the allegation that after Ms. Woodward's dismissal and after the settlement of her dismissal claims, the bank refused to provide a reference to some of those that she applied to and provided a bad reference to others. And now in raising the victimization claims, Ms. Woodward sought to bring into evidence the bank's comments about references during the earlier completed settlement negotiations. And in particular about the bank's refusal to add a clause in the settlement agreement entitling Ms. Woodward to an agreed reference. And she wanted to argue that that showed an attitude in which the bank had reprisal in mind at the time of settling the unfair dismissal claims. 
but the tribunal declined to allow her to put these settlement discussions into evidence, and the EHC upheld that decision. And in doing so, they made clear that the without prejudice rule applies with as much force to cases where discrimination has been alleged as it does to any other form of dispute. And they relied on the importance of being able to speak freely in settlement negotiations in similar terms as the courts do in the civil cases. Now we'll return to Mezzotero and to Woodward later, but I want first to delve into the history of the exception. And the first reference to unambiguous impropriety stems from Lord Justice Hoffman's judgment in the Court of Appeal in Forster and Friedland. And in that case, he suggested that the value of the without prejudice rule would be seriously impaired if its protection could be removed from anything less than unambiguous impropriety. And seven years later in the Unilever and Procter and Gamble case, the Court of Appeal gave a more expansive clarification of that test, explaining that without prejudice is inapplicable where it would act as a cloak for perjury, blackmail, or other unambiguous impropriety. And in that case, Lord Justice Robert Walker emphasized that the exception should be applied only in the clearest cases of abuse of a privileged occasion. And you should note there the emphasis on abusing the privilege. So only in such clear cases is the public interest in the freedom to freely negotiate outweighed by the public interest in disclosure. And as you can see, it's a high bar, and that's a point that's made repeatedly in the authorities. Uh, with Lord Justice Simon Brown, for example, explaining in the uh, Court of Appeal in the Fazal al and Nick Bing case, that there are, in my judgment, powerful reasons for admitting in evidence as exceptions to the without prejudice rule, only the very clearest of cases. And he goes on there to say uh, that unless this highly beneficial rule is most scrupulously and jealously protected, it will all too readily uh, become eroded. Um, more recently, um, last year in the Motorola case, uh, Motorola and Hetera, Lord Justice Mayles spoke of how the courts have jealously guarded any incursion into or erosion of the without prejudice rule observing how the unambiguous impropriety exception could only be applied in truly exceptional cases. Now, ah, I think we've got on one slide too many there. Let's go back one slide, there we go. Also in the Motorola case, uh, Lord Justice Mills emphasized the meaning of unambiguous, and that it's not enough that a possible interpretation of what was said or done was that it was improper. It's not enough that even the probable interpretation leads to that conclusion. And, and the test requires there to be no unambigu unambiguity, sorry, no ambiguity at all about the impropriety of what was said or done. So where the context intimates an acceptable reason for the words or actions, the cloak of privilege should be maintained. Now that stems from the Nick Bin case where the defendant sought to rely on covert recordings in Farsi to show an admission by the claimant that the settlement agreement relied upon was a forgery in that the claimant had their added clauses after signatures. And on reviewing the transcript, the Court of Appeal considered that that was a possible interpretation of the conversation. And in fact, it was probably a quite attractive uh, interpretation of the conversation, but it was not the unambiguous conclusion to be drawn. So one can see uh, the certainty that the Court of Appeal has repeatedly said is necessary before the threshold is met. And as the court explained in Motorola, it's not enough at a preliminary stage for a court to decide that if proven, something would amount to unambiguous impropriety. Hence, in terms of process, the court in Motorola insisted that any evidence which a party asserts satisfies the unambiguous impropriety test should be scrutinized rigorously. And the court was comfortable in that case about setting a threshold whose height might lead to some impropriety being protected. It stems from the policy choice 
that the public interest in settling litigation generally outweighs the risk of abuse of the privilege in an individual case. And the courts have also been consistent as well in recognising the high pressured and the heightened reality of settlement negotiations, and has been resolute in taking that reality into account in setting the unambiguous impropriety threshold. So in the Woodward case, for example, the EAT recognised the reality that negotiations were not, and this may surprise some of you, always be conducted in a calm and dispassionate way, and that within limits, the parties should be free in negotiations to argue their case and to speak their mind. And similarly, in the extraordinary case of Bore and Republic of Djibouti, which I'll come to, the High Court considered whether actions unambiguously exceed what is permissible in settlement of hard-fought commercial litigation. And now, the courts have also looked to the reality of settlement negotiations by seeking to discourage parties from combing through what was said in lengthy, unscripted meetings to see whether a sentence here or there can be relied on to lift the privilege. So in the Force from Freedom case, for example, Lord, Hoff Lord Justice Hoffman warned against picking over the tape-recorded words of the lay party. And in the Unilever case, Robert Walker warned against setting the threshold for the exception at a level which required parties to constantly monitor every sentence with lawyers sitting at their shoulders as minders. And in that case, a reference by a party in a patent infringement settlement negotiation to the threat to bring further litigation, which was a single sentence in a very lengthy meeting, wasn't considered by the Court of Appeal to be oppressive, dishonest or dishonourable and didn't meet the threshold. And likewise, in the Berry Trade and Wasabi case, Lord Justice Peter Gibson considered it quite wrong to select from many hours of without prejudice discussions what are said to be an admission here or an admission there in order to claim that through subsequent statements, the alleged maker of the omissions committed perjury. And he said, were that so, no litigant could be advised to enter into discussions without a lawyer at his elbow or a prepared script approved by his lawyer. So Robert Walker saw us at their shoulders, Peter Gibson sees us at their elbow, I'm not sure anything uh, stems from that. Now the court sees this as deeply unattractive, even if we as lawyers would prefer to incentivize clients to take us along. In the Savings and Investment Bank and Finken case, uh, Mr Finken effectively admitted in settlement negotiations that he had lied in a sworn statement in earlier proceedings. And the Court of Appeal in that case relied on the cases I've just referred to and on uh, Robert Walker's focus on, in the Unilever case, on whether there was an abuse of the privilege in finding that the exception wasn't made out. The admission of past wrong action in attempting to settle the current proceedings wasn't an abuse of the without prejudice privilege. And that privilege is purpose in allowing the parties to attempt to affect settlement. Now let's move on to look at examples where the courts have found that the test of unambiguous impropriety was satisfied. And it's worth starting here in a bit of an unusual place in the British Columbia Court of Appeal in the early 1960s, a case called Greenwood and Fitz, which was a case about rights to cut timber in an Indian reserve. And it was a case in which the defendant really did feel freed from the shackles during the settlement negotiations, telling the other side that if they brought a claim against him, he would perjure himself and bribe witnesses to perjure themselves, and that he would leave Canada to defeat a judgment for damages. I think sometimes honesty is not always the best policy. Uh, and here, the Court of Appeal overturning the first instance court found that without prejudice privilege was never intended to give protection to this sort of thing. But it, it won't always be the case necessarily that saying you will avoid enforcement will satisfy the test. In the Motorola and Hetera case, the Court of Appeal held in Oberta that a threat to transfer assets to a third party, otherwise in the ordinary and proper course of business, in order to render a judgment unenforceable, may 
and I say may, depending on the precise factual context, amounts to unambiguous impropriety, but not necessarily. Notably, when the court rigorously scrutinised the alleged threats in, in that Motorola case, case concerning a claim about a Chinese defendant committing theft of trade secrets from an American claimant, it found angles by which alleged comments by the defendant about transferring assets out of the jurisdiction where the judgment, uh, uh, to places where the judgment might not be enforceable, might not be improper, but could be explicable actions in the ordinary course of business. Now, in the Harwick, uh, Jersey and Kaplan case, it was held that the privilege didn't protect the claimant from disclosure of recordings that showed that he had brought a false claim in order to persuade the defendant to reach a fairer settlement on other matters between them and to settle other differences. And here the recordings contained clear terms of that threat to further a dishonest purpose. Now in the Bore and Djibouti case, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, the Republic of Djibouti uh, sought to persuade the wealthy Mr. Bora to settle commercial proceedings for an amount greater than they had claimed by the sale of all of his assets for Djibouti's benefit. And they made threats in that prejudice meeting, which Mr. Bore had secretly recorded, to further pursue extradition in respect of an unsafe and trumped up in absentia terrorism conviction based on what were clearly unsafe third party confessions. Uh, they also threatened to stop money laundering investigations and also, uh, just to put the boot in a bit further, to widen criminal investigations to his family. Now, the judge there was in no doubt that the nature of these threats fell squarely within the unambiguous and propriety exception, and that the threats unambiguously exceeded what was permissible in settlement of hard fought commercial litigation. And he noted that Djibouti's willingness to trade a terrorism conviction for a lucrative financial settlement spoke volumes about whether it genuinely believed Mr. Bore to be a terrorist. Then faster and faster, you have a tale of three brothers, in which Stuart, Warren and Jonathan, all directors of the same company, and Stuart and Warren arranged for the company to bring a breach of fiduciary duty claim against Jonathan, um, following which Jonathan then brought an unfair prejudice claim again, alleging uh, that the fiduciary uh, duty claim had only been brought in order to pressure him into buying his two brothers' shares in the company at an inflated price. Now, when there was mediation to settle the second unfair prejudice claim, lo and behold, Stuart and Warren wrote to the mediator to increase the price at which they would sell to Jonathan the shares in settlement. And they said that they had increased this offer due to having become aware of further wrongdoings by their brother and a belief that he was in serious trouble and that it would have serious implications also for his partner. Now this related to what they considered to be a partial statement that he'd made about his assets in the fiduciary breach proceedings. And they threatened that they would get the company in those proceedings to bring committal proceedings with criminal action potentially to follow if there was no swift settlement of the unfair prejudice claim against them as individuals. And the brothers were intending to cause the company to refrain from pursuing its claim, therefore, if Jonathan paid them personally more money for their shares. So Jonathan's position was that by this approach to settlement, his brothers had sought to extort a ransom price for their shares. And both the first instance judge and the Court of Appeal agreed that the unambiguous impropriety exception had applied here. As the Court of Appeal put it, the impropriety was in using Jonathan's alleged wrongdoing in the breach of duty case brought by the company as a lever to enable Warren and Stewart to persuade him to pay more for their shares. They found a way to frighten, or to try to frighten Jonathan to pay more for their shares. And those threats had unambiguously exceeded what was proper excuse me, hard-fought commercial litigation. I'm going to move finally then back to the slightly problematic EAT case of Paribas and Mazzotero. Uh, 
Now, in brief, Ms. Mezzotero raised a grievance about her treatment on return from maternity leave. And she was then called into a meeting, which her employer said was without prejudice. And she was told it wasn't viable for her to return to her old job. And it would be best for the business and for her were her employment terminated and were she to accept the redundancy package. She brought claims for direct discrimination and for victimization. And she sought to rely on what was said at that meeting. And the EAT held that she could do so. And the ratio of that decision focused on the lack of any extant dispute at the time of the meeting. And that's concluded that the without prejudice privilege didn't yet bind. But at the end of the judgment, there's brief over to consideration of whether the unambiguous impropriety exception would have applied had the without prejudice privilege been applicable. And the EAT concluded that it would. And counsel for BNP Paribas had accepted in submission that making a comment within without prejudice negotiations that we do not want you here because you are black would amount to unambiguous impropriety. And the EAT looked at that concession and considered that the same must apply to other fact sensitive discrimination allegations, such as that in the Mezzotero case itself. And it appeared, when reading the judgment, that the AT was concluding in Overton that the without prejudice privilege doesn't cloak discussions which one party wants to assert are a breach of discrimination laws, effectively a discrimination exception to the privilege. But that's been clarified, thankfully, and narrowed in the Woodward case where the EAT read Mezzotero as being a case where the claimant's case was that her employer sought to use the cover of without prejudice privilege uh, or without prejudice language to announce a blatantly discriminatory course of action, an attempt being made to cynically abuse the privilege to act in a way which was plainly discriminatory. So the AT rejected the suggestion but there's a wider exception from that prejudice privilege for discrimination claims than for other cases. You have to read Mezzotero more narrowly and perhaps somewhat artificially than it would seem at first sight. Now that completes my journey through the history of this exception, and I'll pass you over to Kath now to talk about Swiss Re. Hello, good afternoon, and it's lovely to have so many of you attending this webinar. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, the uh, Swiss Ray and Sommer case. It's a recent case that was hurried through the Employment Appeal Tribunal in April because final hearing dates in the underlying tribunal case were imminent. The issue in the case at the EAT was whether or not a letter sent by Swiss Ray to Mrs Sommer and labelled as without prejudice was in fact unambiguously improper and so could be seen by the trial judge. <coughs> The background to this matter is that Mrs. Sommer was a political risk underwriter at the Respondent, which is part of the Swiss Ray Group, a global provider of insurance and reinsurance. In the City of London, its offices are in the building officially known as 30 St. Mary Axe, but perhaps better known as the Erotic Gherkin because of its distinctive shape. Mrs. Sommer had been working there since 2017, earning 75,000 plus bonus. In her ET1, she described herself as Indian by race, Guyanese by birth and American by nationality, and that she worked in an otherwise all white male team. She was on maternity leave from 2019 to 2020, and in her first full week back at work in October 2020, she was told that she was at risk of redundancy, but the others in her team were not put at risk of redundancy. She raised a grievance about what she said was the poor redundancy selection pool and other matters in October of 2020. And in December, she was told her grievances had not been upheld. However, while bringing her grievance that autumn, when sending emails to somebody in the workplace about the grievance, on three occasions, she had openly cc'd emails to herself at her personal email address. So any recipient of the email would have seen that. She had also bcc'd or blind copied one of the emails to her husband, who did not work for the respondent. And when later asked if she'd sent any data to a third party, she said no, which was clearly a lie. 
Mrs. Sommer had said she wanted to ensure these particular emails would not get lost if she needed them for future tribunal proceedings. Come back to that point in due course. The emails had attached, amongst other things, the CV of a male colleague, details of various colleagues' work calendars, and information about transactions with clients, including some personal data. In early January 2021, an HR partner told her that she should not have CC'd the emails to herself or be CC'd one to her husband, and described it as a low-level data breach. But on the 19th of January, the claimant was told that a disciplinary investigation was being launched into the emails she'd sent to her and her husband's accounts. That letter was said by her to constitute unambiguous impropriety. It was sent to her by Sliding Co, the respondent solicitors, on the 22nd of January 2021, which is the very same day she put in the first two tribunal claims. So just briefly looking at those claims in the first ET1, which doesn't refer to the letter, she raised a number of complaints of discrimination, victimisation and equal pay. On the 16th of April, she was made redundant and she presented a second claim on the 28th of April, adding claims including unfair and discriminatory dismissal. In this claim, she did refer to the letter that Clyde & Co had sent her on the 22nd of January, which was described as being without prejudice. In its grounds of resistance, unsurprisingly, the respondent defended all the claims and pleaded that the claimant was not allowed to rely on the without prejudice letter of the 22nd of January. So let's look in more detail at this all-important letter. It was a six-page letter headed without prejudice and subject to contract. In it, amongst other things, it said that she breached the confidential confidentiality obligations in her contract of employment and committed a criminal offence under the Data Protection Act 2018, which prohibits knowingly disclosing or retaining personal data without consent. It claimed she'd lied to Swiss when she had previously denied sending any of the information to a third party, i.e. her husband. Uh, it said that she'd acted or might have acted without integrity in breach of financial conduct authority rules. And moving to the next slide, the letter said that her conduct could result in summary dismissal, criminal convictions and fines, and FCA findings, which could make it difficult for her to work again in the regulated sector. After five and a half pages of this, the letter ended by offering a settlement agreement under which her employment would terminate and she'd receive £37,500, or six months' money. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Mrs Sommer, who was a litigant in person throughout, described this letter as threatening, intimidating and harassing. There was a preliminary hearing in December 2021 that dealt with a number of issues. The crucial one for our purposes was an application by Mrs Sommer that the 22nd of January letter was unambiguously improper and so was admissible at the final hearing which naturally was opposed by Swiss. At the hearing uh, before Judge Grawl in Central London Employment Tribunal, she represented, was represented by her husband, a lay representative, and the respondent had counsel. Judge Grawl's conclusions, she was very influenced in her decision-making by her findings that the alleged data breach did not appear from what the respondent was at first saying to Mrs Sommer to be very serious whereas the 22nd of January letter came across as very heavy handed. So, for example, Judge Grawl notes that there was no attempt by the claimant to hide the fact that she'd copied her email to a personal address. And she also noted that the um, issue of the alleged data breach was not investigated by the respondent for some months, suggesting it wasn't that serious. Judge Grawl was also struck by a comment from HR that the possible data breach appeared to involve data that was, quote, generally of a relatively low level. But Judge Grewal later interpreted that point and made it into a finding that the data was definitively of a relatively low level and appears to have ignored the fuller context of what the HR person was saying. She noted also that the letter of the 22nd of January was sent before the investigation into the data breach had concluded. The judge was also struck by the fact that when the investigation concluded, albeit after the letter, was sent, Whilst there had been a breach of the claimant's contract of employment, there was strong mitigation. The claimant was using these emails for her grievance, and there was no evidence of anyone suffering adversely from her having sent them to herself or her husband. The recommendation was for informal action only. 
So turning then to the, uh, to the legal conclusions that Ju Judge Gruel found at the preliminary hearing, two, two important points to start with. She firstly concluded that there was an existing dispute between the parties, and as is well known, for without prejudice privilege to exist, there needs to be an existing dispute. That is one of the differences between the without prejudice rule and discussions, uh, settlement discussions under section 111A of the Employment Rights Act, which we're not otherwise dealing with in this talk. Uh, moreover, Judge Grohl held that the without prejudice letter was sent in an attempt to settle that dispute, which suggests a proper basis for the sending of the letter. And again, this is an important point um, that uh, a without prejudice letter should be going to. Judge Grohl set out the law and correctly noted that she knew that only in truly exceptional circumstances can the correspondence be admitted and the unambiguous impropriety exception be applied, as Jason has set out. But her concern, as I've adverted to already, was the striking disparity between what was known about the alleged misconduct and what was said about it in the letter of 22nd of January. Strikingly, Judge Grohl concluded concluded that in the circumstances there was no basis at all for the respondent solicitors to assert that the claimant had committed serious misconduct that fundamentally undermined the employment relationship or that she committed criminal offences. She also found that the respondent solicitors grossly exaggerated the severity of what the claimant had done to pressure her to accept their offer. She concluded that it was an abuse of privilege and that they had unambiguously exceeded what was permissible in Settlement of hard fought litigation, that well known no phrase. So she found that the letter was not covered by privilege and was admissible at trial. The respondent then, unsurprisingly, appealed. Um, the, the appeal went to the SIFT by uh, Ms. Justice Eady, who had just become president of the EAT uh, at the beginning of this year, and two grounds were allowed to proceed. They're set out on the screen now, essentially, that the judge misunderstood the law or that there was no basis for her findings and or they were perverse. The hearing came in front of Mr. Mr. Justice Bourne on the 12th of April, which was just days before the final hearing was due to start. So turning then to the EAT judgment of Mr. Justice Bourne, once again, the respondent was represented by counsel and Mr. Sommer represented his wife. Counsel had to make all the running because of course, the claimant didn't wish to disturb the judgment of Judge Brawl. Firstly, Mr Justice Bourne did not find that the judge had misdirected herself on the law. She correctly set out the test, so that ground of appeal failed. He then went on to consider, did she correctly apply the law or not, or did she reach a perverse conclusion? In the discussion, Mr Justice Bourne pays a lot of attention to the first from first case, which Jason told us about a few minutes ago, the one with the warring brothers. Bourne goes on to reflect that the question of whether the person making the threats believed the allegations to be true was found to be beside the point at first. Uh, the key thing was the type of threat that was made. After all, it's normal in negotiations for parties to threaten bringing legal proceedings against each other. But in first, uh, the impropriety consisted of using a threat of criminal or, or committal, which are quasi-criminal proceedings, as a lever for settling a civil dispute. This was where the impropriety came in. By contrast, he, he held that in Sommer, there were significant differences. Importantly, Judge Grohl had not found that the threats in the letter or references to criminal or regulatory consequences were of a kind that could not properly be made in the civil proceedings. In this case, the letter was about conduct that was bound up with a continuing employment law dispute. Whereas in Furster, this connection between the alleged conduct and the proposed settlement was not made out. So Mr. Justice Bourne concluded that Judge Gruel had put this case into a slightly different category, a case where the conduct allegations were baseless or grossly exaggerated. The judge thought it may in principle be possible that baseless or exaggerated allegations could be unambiguous impropriety. For example, they could be evidence of dishonesty, but he had not seen case law on this and he held that even if that was the scenario, if the allegation is one of dishonesty, you need to hear oral evidence. Of course, this hearing was a preliminary one where oral evidence is unlikely to be heard. So he said you should not find the communication is unambiguously improper 
if there's a credible argument on each side. Once again, you see how difficult it is to practically persuade a court at a preliminary hearing without oral evidence that there has been unambiguous impropriety. Mr Justice Bourne then grapples with where he says the lower court judge went wrong. While she might have been right to describe the allegations in the letter as exaggerated, she failed to acknowledge that the facts did at least arguably disclose breach of confidence, breach of contract, a breach of data protection legislation and conduct lacking integrity, which was of concern to the FCA. So Judge Grohl's striking reference to the allegations having no basis at all in fact was simply wrong. He held that she could have decided in the claimant's favour on the basis of grossly exaggerated allegations, but would have needed findings about the guilty party's state of mind to do that, and she didn't make any as she would not heard evidence. Now, I confess I find this judgment a little bit confusing in this area. Why would it be necessary to make findings about the guilty party's state of mind before being able to determine if the exaggeration was so bad that this was an example of unambiguous impropriety? Surely the decision does not depend on the state of mind of the author of the communication, but of the content of the document itself. But this is an arguably obiter finding. It may well be persuasive at tribunal level, as the EAT judgment is, of course, binding on the tribunals. So, ground, um, ground two, essentially, the appeal uh, succeeded, and uh, Justice Bourne concluded that the letter was not admissible. So, what uh, conclusions can we draw um, on a legal basis from this, uh, this important decision? The unambiguous impropriety exception to the without prejudice rule is arguably pretty black and white. It's a test that doesn't admit shades of grey. It's a high hurdle to prove that a communication is so unambiguously improper that it defeats without prejudice privilege and is admissible in court. You need to establish that the conduct has been seriously improper, so perjury, blackmail, or behaviour very much akin to those. The conduct does not have to fulfil the definition of blackmail in the criminal courts to succeed, but the conduct does have to be seriously improper. Court needs to identify carefully and with precision exactly what behaviour is said to constitute unambiguous impropriety. Secondly, there must be no ambiguity about the nature of the behaviour complained of. In the Sommer case that we've just heard about, there was, amb there was ambiguity in that it was arguable that the respondent could make out its allegations despite putting them at their highest. After all, the respondent was correct to say that there had been a data breach and potentially that did have to be reported to the FCA. This leads to the third lesson. There must be rigorous scrutiny of the allegations. In this case, Judge Grohl had not heard oral evidence, so was in no position to rule that the letter amounted to an ambiguous impropriety, because on the papers there was an arguable basis for the allegations. Even if they were exaggerated or heavy-handed allegations, the fact that they were based on undisputed facts meant the letter was not unambiguously improper, and so remained inadmissible at trial. It's also important to ensure that any arguments or allegations that are made in a, without prejudice correspondence, correspondence are relevant to the employment dispute at hand, and do not attempt to use a threat of entirely different legal proceedings to achieve your aims in the existing proceedings. And that's one of the lessons of the first case. And what about the point that Judge Grohl had relied on the outcome of the investigation after the without prejudice letter was sent to show that this matter was in fact not as serious as the letter suggested it was? Mr Justice Bourne considers it unlikely that considering later matters could be relevant to a consideration of whether a letter is unambiguously improper, but he doesn't rule it out. So it will be open to a tribunal in the future to look to events post-dating the communication and dispute when considering whether there has been unambiguous impropriety. So, what are the practical conclusions? If you're drafting without prejudice letter, it's important to stick to established or agreed factual scenarios as far as possible, rather than straying into speculation. Ground your statements in, in evidence. Be very wary of exaggeration. It's one thing to put your case at its highest, and Mr Justice Bourne said that exaggeration will not usually amount to an ambiguous impropriety. But in a case of this sort, every line of a without prejudice letter will be scrutinised. So you need to ensure that every line of the letter has an arguably factual basis. In other words, to return to the title of our webinar, you must ensure your communications are not bang out of order 
who you may find the trial judge gets to read them. Strikingly, the judge concluded uh, in the Sommer case that Clyde and Co had sailed close to the wind in the 22nd of January letter that we've been talking about. Well, is that right? Jason and I take a slightly different view on this. My view is that reading the judgment overall and recalling that Mrs. Sommer was a litigant in person, I wonder if the judge was trying to give her something to go away with, to console her as, as she'd lost the argument. He said, in fairness to Mr. and Mrs. Sommer, none of this means that the without prejudice letter was free from any impropriety. But Jason makes a good point that this finding that itself close to the wind may put a chill in lawyers' hearts because the judgment holds that whilst threatening criminal or regulatory action may not be prohibited in without prejudice correspondence, there's a danger of applying improper pressure by doing so. And ultimately, of course, this is an EAT decision that's binding on tribunal judges. A criticism I'd make of this judgment, though, or this part of it, is that Mr Justice Bourne doesn't explain what, what, if this letter sailed close to the wind, would tip it over the edge and make it unambiguously improper. Separately, another lesson to come from this case is that an employee who, either because they're running a grievance or planning tribunal proceedings, should not send work emails to their personal email address if there's any chance that by so doing, they'll breach a term of their contract or a code of conduct, or a regulatory stricture to which they're subject. Now, apparently this is called evidence banking, which was a new phrase to me, um, but I think it's apt to describe the process. I expect we've all come across examples of this happening. It seems fairly commonplace in my experience that uh, a potential claimant is um, caught out or found to have copied work emails to a personal email account to make sure they've got a copy of them. Potential claimants should be advised it's likely to be a dangerous thing to do, and it may open them to disciplinary proceedings depending on what their contract says. And on the screen, I've got an example of a case in which this practice was disapproved, Brando Advisors of Chadwick. So we've reached the end of our speaking part of the webinar. Uh, we need to know if anyone's thought of a better way to refer to unambiguous impropriety, and we're going to uh, go into the, uh, the the main hearing itself and uh, get rid of the slides. Have we got any answers? Right, well, we've, we've got two answers to this, um, and they're both quite brave. I think we put their answers pretty early on mm. before we'd explained uh, anything about it. Um, Jackie Morris has it as bordering on criminal. Uh, and Mark Pritchard has clear wrongdoing. Um, I think I feel sort of like a bit like Philip Schaefer about to offer you uh, free, um, that we're going to pay your energy bills for a couple of months in, in announcing this. Um, but I think, um, and, and Jackie, you just said many thanks for being so clear. I, I think you might be trying to bribe the judges here. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm going to give uh, Mark's clear wrongdoing. Um, because there are circumstances in which bordering on criminal it isn't going to necessarily cover things that are still unambiguously improprietors. So, uh, Mark, you get the fuzzy feeling. Uh, the pass on the back. Um, Jackie, you can also have a fuzzy feeling uh, uh, as well. Um, yes, in that I, regard. I rather wish we'd come up with clear wrongdoing before we had to go through the word salad of unambiguous impropriety so many times, but uh, it is really quite a mouthful. So thanks very much for those great suggestions. And where are we on the Q&A? Um, let's have a look. Um, right. Well, we, um, we have um, a couple of questions. So uh, yeah. Paul McFarlane, uh, Welcome, I think we've got some privilege to have the uh, new chair of the uh, ELA here with we us. We are not worthy. Absolutely, not um, and congratulations on that. Um, his first question is a very tough question for us. It says, excellent webinar, uh, please can the slides be circulated to attendees? Um, and, and the answer is yes um, to that. Um, we're not sure at this moment in time whether it will be emailed to you or, or whether uh, it will be on the website or, or both, uh, but there'll certainly be uh, made available uh, and when um, Sophie, our marketing director, comes back from a very well-earned break, um, she'll sort that out next week. There's also a danger this webinar may appear on our YouTube channel as mm. well, so um, should you wish to go through it all again, you should have the opportunity. Um, and then on to Paul's second, a very good question. How then does a claimant gather their evidence if they're not being able to evidence bank? Well, I suppose the answer has to be the disclosure process um, and, if necessary, uh, an application for specific disclosure. The, the difficulty really is, as I've outlined in the talk, 
it could well be a breach of their uh, employment contract or code of conduct to evidence bank, as, as we're calling it. Um, as Mrs. Sommer found, it, it potentially could lead her open to um, criticism by the FCA and affect her ability to work in that field in future. So it was taken very seriously. Um, do you have anything? No, I was just going to say the, the other is obviously the thing that employers hate more than anything else, which is a subject access request. Um, yes. But uh, yeah, I mean, the, the answer is remember, recall, and, uh, and probably be a bit more be a bit patient on that unfortunately. Yes. Um, Andrew Furman has asked out of interest did um, the ET claim proceed or did it settle after this? Yes and, and I can answer that one it oh, did yes. proceed um, mm -hmm. uh, and it didn't settle it, it went ahead and she won some claims and lost some claims is, 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 is the gist of that so yes she was entitled to what well found the well founded that some of her claims uh, succeeded. Um, so, oh, we're back on evidence banking. It's interesting how this has become quite a, uh, a, a, it's a very good practical point, evidence banking, isn't it? So a question from Mirek, um, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your surname, Mirek. Um, uh, so let me just read the question. Do you think that the claimant could print the emails into PDF and keep them for herself only and not pass them to any third parties? Usually claimants do this, as later during subject access requests, respondents do not provide all evidence. Again, it's a really good point. Um, the number of times we hear claimants complaining that subject access requests are, are really partial. Uh, well, I think it's almost every time it comes up in, in my experience. But as for printing the emails into PDFs and keeping them for itself, uh, again, it's very dangerous for a claimant, particularly de depending on the type of contract they have and the type of work they're doing. What if they were to have their bag containing these pieces of paper stolen um, and they, they could perhaps be um, very seriously um, um, uh, private uh, matters that they've printed out onto paper. Um, it could get them into a lot of trouble. Um, and of course, it could cause trouble for the people who are written about in these emails as well. So I think that's, that, that really is the point. One, one of the, the major concerns of Swiss Re in this case and often of respondent employers in, in correspondence in these things is that the uh, thing that is printed out isn't likely to be exclusively about that individual, but it's going to be about other data subjects as well. Uh, and, and therein lies the real key problem. Now, it may be that some are in regulated and some are not in regulated um, professions and that therefore the uh, potential consequences of doing so are going to be greater in some circumstances and, and, and lesser in others. Um, but it's, it, it's certainly something that uh, you ought to have in mind um, when advising claimants who are thinking of jumping ship or yes. let's say that they are uh, but, on the edge of being dismissed. But, but the case law is, is pretty clear that it's not acceptable. Um, and as well as the case on the slide, um, there are a couple more that I've um, dug out um, Tokyo Marine Kill Insurance Services and Mrs. Yi Yang, 2013 EWHC 1948, Queen's Bench Division, and a case, a very recent case, Nissan and Passy, 2021 EWHC 3642, and that's the Chancery Division. Um, they are very much um, on, the, um, on the same page. It, it cannot be right for a defendant to retain information in breach of contract simply to bolster their claim in the Employment Appeal Tribunal uh, was the um, comment in the Tokyo Marine case. Uh, if there are documents to be disclosed in that dispute, they will be disclosed in the normal way. This sort of preemption is not therefore valid. I'm not entirely sure how much experience that judge has of normal disclosure, but hey, that's the judgment. So the courts do not approve of evidence banking, it seems. So your clients should be careful of that. Um, unless anyone has any further questions they just want to quickly type now uh, whilst I'm speaking very slowly um, I think that may well be it you finished within time which is as counsel unusual to finish within um, time estimates is something that I very very rarely do when I'm in tribunal uh, I don't know about you Kath um, yeah. but thank you very much for joining us we hope that it's been uh, informative um, if you want to watch it again uh, and again 
And again, um, it will be on our YouTube channel, the 42 Bed for a YouTube channel in the next couple of weeks. I'm sure that my children are going to watch them and laugh at me um, at some point in time. And uh, thank you for joining us. We hope you have a good evening. We hope it's been useful to you. Um, and don't forget, you get a CPD point, so it's all been worth it. <laughs> absolutely. And we look forward to seeing some of you in real life soon uh, at our um, annual lecture, which doubtless you'll have had information about. Well, well remembered, yes. yes. Good, good point. There we go. Okay. Marketing as well. Thanks very much, everybody. Uh, and we're going to close the seminar now. Thank you. Goodbye.